Thank you for joining us. Our guest today is Dr. Aubrey de Grey, Chief Science Officer and Co-Founder of SENSE, Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence. Dr. de Grey is a biomedical gerontologist and a PhD in biology from the University of Cambridge. He's also a fellow of both the Gerontological Society of America and the American Aging Association. He is closely involved with research worldwide and will share his views on aging as a curable disease following these messages. Our first presentation this afternoon is going to be our good friend, Mr. Bill Falloon. Let's give him a warm welcome. The Church of Perpetual Life was established to unite like-minded individuals into an organization that teaches scientific rationality and accelerates the Creator's plan for mankind to develop technologies that will facilitate the transformation of life into an environment of perpetual duration. The individual that we are somewhat impressed with in the past, Nikolai Fedorov, he was able to ascertain over 150 years ago that people shouldn't have to die. There should be a way to meaningfully extend their lifespan. And our premise is that involuntary death is unacceptable. We don't know of any rational argument in which someone would prefer illness to good health. We don't know how anyone could rationally argue that involuntary death is preferable to vibrant life. An increasing number of people are rebelling against the notion of involuntary death. These enlightened individuals are fighting back. They're fighting back against the scientific and societal inertia that is robbing us of our youth, our health, and our very lives. Now you wonder, what do we need to do at church? Why do we need this building and this facility and this program? Well, the reason is people are needlessly dying today. Just as Fedorov demonstrated this 100 and 150 years ago, uh, they're dying needlessly today. They're dying because they're not accessing information that is documented in the peer-reviewed scientific literature, but it's either suppressed or it's repressed by our academic situation, our pharmaceutical complex, we're being denied information. And one bit of information that we've talked about in the church before is a pharmaceutical called metformin. This drug was approved in Europe in 1958 and was rapidly approved throughout the world after that. But Americans had to wait till 1994 to gain access to it. Metformin is the most effective treatment in type 2 diabetes, but it also has ancillary benefits that may be even greater than treating diabetes. Now in 2012, metformin made headline news, but it didn't surprise us. We've been studying metformin for over 25 years, and they found that metformin prevents cancer. And when given to cancer patients, it reduces the odds of the cancer patient dying. It is an effective cancer treatment. And if a, a diabetic takes metformin, their risk of pancreatic cancer is reduced 62%. Now, how many people in this congregation at this point in time know an individual who died of pancreatic cancer? Raise your hand. How many of you know somebody? I mean, it's virtually 100% lethal. And, and diabetics, by the way, are at a very high rate for contracting pancreatic cancer. But if they take the drug metformin, their risk is reduced by 62%. And yet Americans had to wait for 37 years before they could access a drug that was being used successfully in other countries. It wasn't really experimental, it was being used, but it was suppressed by the apathy that exists in this country. This church is, has been established to overcome that apathy that causes people to needlessly suffer and die. And considering the scientific discoveries that we have seen over the last 100 years, we have a duty to our fellow man to share information that could result in a human living as opposed to dying prematurely. And this is one of the premises of our church. Now again, with pancreatic cancer, someone diagnosed 
Uh, they're sometimes given an option of surgery. It's a horrific procedure. Most people do not live even after undergoing the agonies of the surgery. However, a study published in 2006 showed that if a drug that was approved long ago called interleukin-2 is administered just three days prior to surgery, the survival outcomes are markedly improved. And if you look at this simple graph, you see that the two-year survival in people given interleukin-2 is substantially better than the ones that were giving the control group. But after three years, you see 22% of those pancreatic cancer patients are alive compared to 0% in the control group not given the interleukin-2. This is just a little tidbit of information that we've already disseminated at a previous service at this church. But if you or a loved one were to contract pancreatic cancer, this one little tidbit of information could markedly improve their odds of surviving this horrific disease. And for those who are concerned about hospital complications, there's many of them, those who had the interleukin-2 suffered far fewer complications. And they got out of the hospital a lot sooner. Now that study that you saw the data on should have made headline news. It didn't, it was buried in the scientific literature. Now I've been talking about interleukin-2 for a long time. A few other enlightened doctors have been doing that also, but it hasn't reached the public mainstream. Our church will disseminate this information. We wanna make it available. Cytomegalovirus, most of you have it. Most of you probably think it's not a big deal. The problem is if you have cytomegalovirus, it increases the risk of you dying prematurely. One study showed people dying about 3.7 years sooner if they had active cytomegalovirus infection. CMV is the acronym for that. And yet there are ways in which you can suppress CMV so that it does not accelerate your aging process. What we found is that people with active CMV, it exhausts their immune system prematurely. So as they age, they become more vulnerable to pneumonia, to cancers, to all kinds of problems that involve a defective immune system because it's often caused by a CMV infection that the doctors didn't think there was a big deal. So you can see some of the data. People with high CMV antibody titers, they die sooner. They have increases in mortality. Our objective here, of course, is to decrease mortality. And the last slide I'm gonna show before Aubrey is introduced is brain cancer patients. This is where we first started looking seriously at the CMV situation. It turns out that uh, CMV is present in about 99% of glioblastoma patients. And if you give these patients an anti-CMV drug called valgancyclovir, you markedly extend their lifespan. Most of you remember Senator Edward Kennedy, who was diagnosed with glioblastoma, and he died right on time, about 15 to 16 months after being diagnosed with that cancer. He died, just like every other glioblastoma patient will die in about 15 months. With the knowledge we now have that CMV is involved in the pathogenesis of this disease, we can now recommend valgancyclovir. And just recently, we had a patient who was given several days to live. Their glioblastoma had progressed to the point where it was eroding the support structure of their brain. Their brain was literally collapsing into their spinal column. Now, we didn't give the valgancyclovir drug much of a chance of working, but the, but the patient care advocate said, you know what, we're just gonna try it anyway. And you know what? Within two weeks, that person got out of the hospital. As far as I know, in mid-December, they were given a couple days to live. We're here in April. They're back to normal function. They're back to work. They're back to living a normal lifespan because they were given the drug valgancyclovir, and that information was disseminated through an email that I sent to this individual. This is the kind of information we're going to share at this church so that no one dies when there's an effective therapy. I'm gonna... <laughs> now today we have a special guest. He came all the way from the Bay Area just to give us a, a talk. He gave us a talk a little bit over the weekend to some young uh, immortalists who also came from literally around the country and around the world. We have one individual from Moscow, a number of people from Europe, and they're here for the first time at this Church of Perpetual Life. I'd like to introduce Aubrey de Grey. All right. <clears throat> I'm just gonna use this for notes. 
Uh, so I just w first of all want to thank Bill very deeply for um, hosting me at this event and also, of course, the past couple of days at the event that he just mentioned, the Teens and Twenties convention that he's been holding here for the past four or five years. It's a great, great pleasure to me to hang out with such sensible people. <laughs> That's really what it's all about. It's wonderful to be here. Normally, an audience is either largely scientifically, bi biologically sophisticated or they're largely biologically unsophisticated. And it's generally harder to speak to an audience that is very mixed. But in that respect, this audience is also extremely diverse. So what I've decided to do today is not actually to use any slides at all and not to give anything that would be considered my kind of traditional talk. After all, those of you who are familiar with my work have seen it all before, and those of you who aren't can always go to YouTube. There's an awful lot of me on YouTube these days. Um, so what I'm going to do instead is give a talk that I think is perhaps more attuned to people who really are committed to the anti-aging concept, to, to people who really understand that aging is the world's worst problem. This is something that I think uh, really combine, it really brings all of you together. It's the reason why you're in a building with the name that this building has, really. So I think that's a safe bet that I'll be speaking to the, um, the common denominator of everyone here. And in order to do that, what I'm going to try and do is share some of my own experiences in this field, especially my experiences as one of the figurehead leaders of it, and give some clues, so to speak, perhaps some, some ideas as to how you guys can make a difference. The title I wrote down for this talk was How I Got This Way and How You Can Do the Same or Preferably More, which is um, more or less what I'm going to try and talk about. So first of all, let me start with how I got this way, you know, how I've been able to make such a difference. I feel, you know, just, just indescribably privileged being the person I am in the position I'm in. You know, I, there's very, very few people in the world who can look at themselves and say that they really are spending their lives doing the thing that they most wanted to do and actually achieving it. You know, it's, it's an extraordinary privilege. So I think I want to emphasize some of the transitions I made over the years that helped me to understand how to be most effective. The first one happened when I was very, very young. I was probably about eight or nine. So, I did mention earlier that the concept that we pursue is to strike at what we view as the weak link between being alive and being dead, rather than trying to intervene and manipulate this extraordinarily complex thing called metabolism that keeps us going, or indeed to really focus on the ill health that's so complicated and multifactorial late in life, instead focus in the middle on the mediators, the changes to the body that accumulate initially harmlessly until middle age and then eventually drive these diseases and disabilities. And really the big first step that made the, this approach feasible was to break it down into a manageable number of sub-problems, just seven sub-problems. Uh, the good thing about this particular classification of the many, many, many things that go wrong with you in old age and go, what go wrong with you throughout life, is that within each category there is a generic therapy, a generic way of dealing with it. So the first category is loss of cells, cells dying and not being automatically replaced by the division of other cells. And stem cell therapy exists to fix that problem. Of course, not only in ageing, but certainly in some aspects of ageing which are predominantly driven by that, such as Parkinson's disease. Stem cell therapy is the, is the sense approach, the maintenance approach, the repair approach to stopping people from getting things like Parkinson's disease. Then there's having too many cells because they're dividing when they're not supposed to. That's what cancer is. We have a particular approach to maybe really bringing cancer under control. It's really elaborate. It's really difficult to implement. And we hope to God that we're not going to need it and that somebody else will come up with something much simpler that really works against all cancers as well as... Uh, approach will work when we get it working. Um, and then there's also having too many cells because cells are not dying when they are supposed to. 
Um, that actually comes back to the cytomegalovirus that we mentioned earlier. It turns out that if you've got CMV infections, then over time you get an accumulation of white blood cells that are trying to eliminate this infection and not quite succeeding. And those cells hang around in such large numbers that they inhibit the proliferation of other immune cells and thereby inhibit the efficacy of the immune system to fight off other more acute infections. So those are three types of damage, and they're all at the level of numbers of cells, having too many or too few. The other four types of damage are molecular. So two of them happen inside cells. There are mutations in the mitochondria, the special parts of the cell that do the chemistry of breathing, the, the, the combining of oxygen with nutrients to extract energy from those nutrients. Um, the DNA there gets mutated much, much more rapidly than the DNA in, um, in our nucleus, in our normal chromosomes. And we are trying to fix that by putting backup copies of that DNA into the nucleus, uh, in, modified in such a way that it still works, even though the DNA is in the wrong place, so to speak. The other problem inside the cell is molecular waste products, just stuff that the cell makes as byproducts of what it normally does, but which the cell does not know how to destroy or to excrete. And uh, just as your kitchen doesn't work so well if you have it um, if you don't take out the garbage for a month, then similarly the cell doesn't work so well eventually when it's accumulated too much of this garbage. Um, then outside the cell you've also got molecular waste products and they cause similar problems. It turns out that the garbage is intrinsically easier to fix than the stuff that naturally accumulates inside the cell, which means that simply transferring it into the cell is, is all you need to do. You can actually use the immune system for that purpose. And then finally there's stiffening. There's this lattice of proteins called the extracellular matrix, which gives our tissues and organs their shape and their physical properties. And in particular, they give, it gives them elasticity, which is really important for some things like our major arteries. And these arteries get stiffer over time. That's why we get hypertension in, the, in old age. And that's caused by the accumulation of additional chemical bonds that we don't want. So we need to develop drugs or maybe enzymes that break those bonds. How do I see the parallels between what I'm trying to do and what other heretics of other areas of science have done in the past? And of course, there's a great deal of similarity. The example that, that was mentioned was the person who proposed the idea of continental drift. Now, you know, who really cares whether continental drift happens or not? You know, it's not a health issue. So, in that sense, it was a kind of, like, a parochial thing within a, within a small scientific community. But, of course, in anything to do with health, the situation is not like that at all. The example that I often use that's a similar one is that of, of Semmelweis, the guy, the Hungarian doctor who was the first to realise, or at least the first we know of, who realised that hygiene is quite a good idea in hospitals and in doing, you know, medical treatments, or even, you know, childbirth, things like that. And by introducing uh, you know, washing of hands and such like into hospitals, he saved a lot of lives. But when he tried to get this out there as a, as a good idea that other people might use, he was viciously opposed. And it took more than 10 years before Louis Pasteur came along and said more or less the same thing and was able, through perhaps just better political influence, to actually get it heard and get it out there and succeed in saving the most insane number of lives. The number of lives that were lost in that interim over those you know, more than 10 years was probably considerably more than the number of lives that were lost because of metformin not being... Um, so, you know, we're looking at a very serious recurring problem in the way that society adopts and understands new ideas. And, you know, that's human nature. I've kind of made my peace with it, but it doesn't stop me fighting extremely hard to minimise the impact of that in my own work. Thanks very much. With us now is Dr. Aubrey de Great. A real pleasure and honor to have you on the show, sir. Thank you. So you are regarded in certain different ways. You're admired and also supposedly controversial. Why so? Well, I think anyone who works in an area of pioneering technology risks being controversial. There will be people who think that their ideas are likely to be feasible in the foreseeable future, and there are people who are likely to be more pessimistic. So that's kind of not surprising. But in the area that I work in, which is the medical control of something that has, since the dawn of civilization, been the world's worst problem, you know, that kind of intensifies the controversy, if you like. 
Um, it's not, never been something that surprised me. I've always kind of been ready for that. But yeah, that's how it is. Back to controversy. So many people suffer in this world, and we, we can't really get into the topic in depth. Uh, our friend Bill Falloon speaks about this constantly. But anyway, back again to controversy. Some people are so involved with tradition, and some people regard many beliefs as a crutch. And of course, there are conflicts. People like traditional funerals. Other people are choosing more and more to be cryonically preserved. What's your view on cryonics? Well, the key thing that everyone needs to understand about cryonics is that it's not a method of disposal of human remains. Cryonics is a type of health care. In other words, the whole idea of cryonics is to preserve the health of people who are already alive. Of course, their health is in a very poor state when they are cryopreserved, but then it was in a very poor state just before they were cryopreserved too. So the idea, of course, is to restore that health once we have the medical technology to do so. Now, in order to make that case, one obviously also needs to explain to people the fact that death is a different thing if you define it legally, where someone is either alive or dead and not somewhere in between, versus if you define it biologically and medically. And in particular, that from the biological, the medical perspective, we simply don't actually know when someone dies. That's why the legal definition of death has evolved over the years, to be starting off being just cardiac arrest and eventually incorporating brain death and so on. Now, I think that it's generally accepted that when someone's alive, it's a good thing to try to keep them alive. And I think it's also generally accepted that when someone's actually dead, then they're dead and they're going to stay dead. But what's not adequately discussed and adequately understood is that there can be this gray area in the middle where we don't know whether they're dead. And then the only question is what we should do with someone when they might be dead or they might not be. I say that it's pretty clear that we ought to give them the benefit of the doubt, so to speak. And indeed, I'm not the only one who thinks this. Even George Bush, in fact, I think it was the first George Bush, said that um, you know, we ought to give the benefit of the doubt when people are in a very bad state. And we ought not to permit euthanasia, for example. I feel that it's exactly the same moral argument. You founded the organization SENSE. Tell us about it. Sense Research Foundation doesn't do cryonics. I think I first of all want to point that out because we're in a cryonic-centric um, situation right here. Um, we do biomedical research to try to make sure that people don't need to be cryopreserved because they stay healthy enough, their hearts carry on beating, they stay truly youthful however long they live. At the moment, of course, medicines for the diseases and disabilities of old age are far, far less effective, by and large, than medicines for, let's say, infectious diseases that we've developed over the past century or more. And I want to change that, and that's what Sense Research Foundation is for. Dr. Degree, there is a $20,000 prize. I think MIT instituted this uh, challenge to people to try to disprove or claim that your work is not worthy of debate and no one has succeeded in disproving it. <laughs> the MIT Technology Reviews Prize was actually designed in order to, if you like, smoke out the opposition, to ensure that when people were saying that the views that I and my colleagues were putting forward were unscientific and were, should be ignored, that they actually were put on the spot and made to explain, from scientific perspective, why they felt that, which was not happening prior to that. And in fact, the precursor of Sense Research Foundation, the Tiesler Foundation, put up half the money. We actually wanted this to happen. So it was, of course, extremely gratifying that the challenge was successful from our point of view. In other words, nobody actually succeeded in convincing a neutral panel of experts that the um, basis of our work was unscientific. However, of course, that's only the first step. Being scientific doesn't mean it's going to happen. And so now, of course, we have the hard work of actually getting on and doing the science. Fifty years ago, therapies that were regarded as science fiction back then are science fact today. And arguably, what we think may be possible in the future is likely to be. Tell us about this. Well, I think it's always very dangerous to point to the past and say, well, this or that was thought to be obviously impossible and then it was done, therefore something in the future can. I think that that's an overgeneralization. Some things really are impossible. However, when you're looking at a really hard technological problem, the first step is to break it down. 
to uh, describe more and more in detail how to dissect it into sub-problems that are in some way easier and more tractable and about which you already know something of the solution. And that's exactly what I did in creating the concept of sense, the divide and conquer strategy that we pursue at Sense Foundation. So I think we're moving in the right direction. Of course, it's still the case that there are a number of components of sense which are at an early stage and which may just not be able to work. But the simple fact of having a plan is a very big step forward. If we end up changing some of the plans, finding shortcuts, finding easier ways to do some of these things, nobody will be happier than me. I had the privilege of interviewing Professor Susan Greenfield at Oxford University, a baroness actually, mm -hmm. and she's doing research into Alzheimer's disease and so forth, and you're a graduate, a PhD from Cambridge. Mm -hmm. uh, what breakthroughs exist today that you might share with our audience? Well, in Alzheimer's disease, there's still a long way to go, no question. But actually, things are looking a bit better than most people think. And this actually is a great example of what I was saying a moment ago about divide and conquer. Alzheimer's disease was defined over a century ago as being the combination of having two types of waste product in the brain. One that's inside our brain cells, called tangles, and another that's outside in the spaces between cells. They're called plaques. And we now have therapies that can absolutely get rid of plaques. They can just remove them. It's a therapy using stimulation of the immune system, and it went through trials a couple of years ago. Now, the thing that I want to emphasize is that those trials were superficially unsuccessful. But the measure of success was overall cognitive improvement, actual treatment of Alzheimer's disease. And that was the wrong measure, because the treatment was only designed to address one of the components of Alzheimer's disease. I believe that the success of those trials in removing that component is a marvelous thing. It means that in the future, as we develop corresponding therapies to address the other components of Alzheimer's disease, we will have this in our back pocket to combine with that one um, so that we can actually have a comprehensive treatment. Before we conclude, what are your plans for the immediate future? I try not to make too many plans for the immediate future because my life is so busy. Uh, but, of course, my goal is, you know, in the medium term, is to become obsolete. My goal is to grow this movement, to help to grow this movement fast enough and far enough so that there are people in it who are not just as dedicated as me, but who are actually better than me at all the things I'm good at, so that I become less necessary. And then I will feel that my job is done. Well, I must say it's been a real pleasure and privilege to have you on the show. Thank you so much for being with us. It's my pleasure too. Thank you. A lot of success.